Okay. A very warm welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the fourth trading debate, where we'll be discussing trading volatility and performance today. Just wanted to do a bit of housekeeping, first of all. Times have changed. We used to say, switch off your phones. Now we say, please don't switch off your phones, but put them on silent. Uh, by all means, tweet away, share on Facebook, social media. You are probably all very well used to using it. As you can see, there's a Twitter screen up there. People will be following us along, posting their questions, getting involved in the debates throughout the afternoon. Please feel free to send your questions, hashtag trading debates, and they'll appear on the screen. We'll endeavor to get your questions answered by some of the panelists this afternoon. So please feel free to follow along. Last time we had about two and a half million people join in online to this event, as well as 600 people taking part uh, involved on the day. So you're very welcome, and we will try and involve as many people as possible and make this as an inclusive event as possible. I'd like to welcome some of our key Twitter influencers as well who are joining us, not just in the audience, but also online as well. Pavel Morsky, at Pavel Morsky, Francis Coppola, and mine for nothing. There's also a competition today. If you are going to take part on Twitter, a prize of one iPhone 6 and three iPad minis. And the prizes will go to the most active tweeter. So get those thumbs working. The most original tweet, the highest impact, which is about the number of times it gets retweeted. Uh, go to the website if you want to see all the terms and conditions at saxomarkets.com. So at the end of every panel discussion, you'll have a chance to put your hand up and ask a question, or you can also send your questions in hashtag trading debates. You'll hear that and see that a lot this afternoon. So here we are at the British Museum and a very suitable location. We're just feet away from exhibits from Babylonian times where you could argue that Forex began with paper money being used, notes being used, exchanged. Rome, where coins from different countries were exchanged, and where salt was so precious that it gave us the word salary today. As you came in today, you may well have passed an ancient Egyptian obelisk, and money was found inside some of the tombs of the ancient pharaohs. So we're here to debate ancient trades in modern times and to try to put some focus on where the future may lie. And with that in mind, may I please introduce our first speaker of the afternoon, uh, speaking on the evolution of markets and innovation, head of business lines at Saxo Bank, Matteo Cassina. I just want to mix uh, water with someone, maybe with Ebola or something else. I don't know who drank this. <laughs> Was it yours? Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Matteo Cassina. I'm the head of the line of business at Saxo Bank, and I'm a member of the executive uh, committee of the bank. Uh, as a business that was founded uh, 20 years ago, uh, we pride ourselves as being at the forefront of uh, innovation. And we started really uh, our business uh, with the internet. Uh, and very early, the founder of the company embraced that uh, technology. Uh, I'm very excited today uh, by all the sessions that we're going to have uh, uh, later after me. Um, and, all of the, and I'm grateful for all of the people that accepted to participate. And uh, we have some of the most uh, influential uh, thinkers uh, in market structure and uh, uh, technology. Um, there's never been a more exciting time uh, to look at uh, market structure, uh, technology, and banks. Uh, I stress exciting, uh, interesting, and not exciting, sorry, because when you are in a company which has been uh, heavily challenged uh, by the technology and by the newcomers, uh, it's horrible times. And when you are a newcomer, it's exciting times. When you think about uh, Nokia, for example, a few years ago, you know, being a dominant player in the mobile uh, uh, telephone industry, I'm sure that uh, 
they were not very excited when they saw that industry becoming much bigger and them not being part of it because of their legacy technology and, uh, and where they came from. Um, we've seen a, a period of uh, restructuring in the financial markets. Uh, we've seen a crisis. Uh, we've seen technological innovation forcing banks to consider whether uh, once restructured they could uh, remain profitable and uh, whether they would stay in uh, certain businesses. Uh, but the technological, the technological step change will uh, wipe out a number of uh, players in the industry. And we've seen some early signs of it. Uh, if we look at the uh, tipping point which uh, we saw in the consumer industry uh, and what happened uh, a decade ago, I think we are at the beginning of uh, a similar trend in, uh, in the banking industry. Um, um, there are many drivers uh, to the bank restructuring uh, and what we've seen today, including rising cost of capital, declining profit margin, litigation risks, uh, and the complexity and the technology cost. Uh, for the presentation today, I will focus much more on the technology part of uh, those challenges. Uh, and uh, uh, in the coming months, we'll see many banks and brokers that will have to take very, very tough decision and, and decide whether they will be leaders in, uh, in that space, in a specific asset class, in a specific part of the value chain, or whether they'll decide to exit or they will be forced to exit. Um, so it would be very important to, to understand uh, you know, what technology can do and understand uh, um, the market structure, the depth of the market structure, to take very, very strategic decision on where firms uh, are going to decide uh, to, decide, uh, to go. Uh, and we're having, although we are at the forefront of that innovation, we, we keep on looking at our business model and every year we keep on reconsidering whether the direction we've taken is the right direction or not because we, we feel the challenges of some uh, uh, newcomers, uh, innovative, that will take a slice of our business. Um, I've been in the industry for uh, around 20 years. I've been uh, uh, working for some of the biggest uh, global broker dealers in the world. Uh, I've seen the challenges, I've seen the opportunities. I then moved on and worked for one of the most uh, prominent high-frequency trading firms uh, in the world. Uh, and now I work for, in, in my opinion, one of the most uh, better-placed organizations in the trading space, uh, in the fintech uh, space. So I will now uh, go through uh, a few illustrations on how I define uh, market structure using uh, five uh, key pillars. Uh, and I would like to stress that you know, the view that I'm going to give here is uh, narrow uh, and it's only to do with uh, uh, exchanges, broker dealers, custodian, prime brokers, uh, banks, uh, retail in the context of uh, trading listed and uh, listed securities and effects. Um, so the, the five pillars uh, uh, that I define uh, and I will uh, elaborate here are the global exchanges, um, the large broker dealers, and we've invited uh, Sarah and uh, Andrew uh, to represent two of the most, I would say, advanced uh, organization, uh, Nomura and uh, UBS, that have decided to invest heavily in technology and in our opinion will be around for many years to come in that uh, space, in that business. Um, the third pillar is uh, the global banks. Uh, the fourth pillar is the electronic market makers. The fifth is uh, what we call technology or the fintech space. Uh, and I'm going to go through some uh, slides. Uh, we didn't use PowerPoint because we thought it was uh, legacy technology, so we decided to go back and use something which is more legacy, which is, uh, if it works, handwriting. And uh, I didn't do it myself. Uh, I wanted to. If you see my sketches, uh, you'll be horrified. Uh, this was done by Chris Burke, and I think that a good representation of what I asked him to do. So if you look at the exchanges, what happened is that there was a, a trigger, uh, and the trigger was a change of regulation. The change of regulation uh, uh, stopped uh, the monopolies and, and effectively created competition to uh, the exchanges. And, and what happened then is that we went from, uh, from a world where the exchange all owned 100% of uh, the liquidity, 100% of the volume, had the pricing power and decided how much to charge uh, 
members uh, to trade, uh, especially when they became uh, listed companies themselves and for-profit organizations. You know, there was a phase where they were utility to the to the broker dealer community, and then at some point when they started. Uh, Want, you know, then when, when they li were listed and became a profit organization in their own right, they, they stopped innovating because of the ecosystem they were operating in. And when uh, the regulation changed and allowed organizations such as uh, ChaiX to come along, uh, what, what happened is uh, that those new players came into this space with a technology that was uh, 100 times faster, one-tenth the cost, and very rapidly what happened is that they dropped the cost of trading to one-tenth, and that completely changed the landscape. And what happened, the same as in the broker-dealer space, some of the key players here, you know, Deutsche Börse, LSE, Euronext, uh, had the muscles, had the diversified business model, uh, and they started, uh, they kept on growing, they innovated, uh, some of them acquired LSE, acquired uh, Turquoise, uh, they're acquiring other, other businesses, but they're also powering the matching engine of other exchanges globally to uh, acquire a scale and to be able to have a unit cost which is uh, uh, in line and that can allow them to compete with the more nimble players. Um, the second pillar uh, is the large broker dealers. This is, uh, again, it's uh, some of the CEOs of uh, uh, this organization will be horrified if we compare them to tire manufacturers. But, the, but this is, uh, for me, a, a very, very uh, stark change in the business model. You know, th this organization were different, they had the completely different DNA from manufacturing companies. And in the last 10 years, the challenges in this part of the value chain became very, very similar to the challenges of organization in the manufacturing uh, industry. So there were many, many uh, producers of tires. Now there are very few of them. And, and those that remain have distribution, scale, technology. Uh, and they, they collaborate in an environment that has many players, all of them specialized, that provide one component of that value chain. I'd like here to, to just give you some uh, numbers because it's, uh, it's always difficult to, 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 to understand what really happened in this industry. I was working for a big broker dealer in uh, 2000. Uh, I walked into the trading floor and we had uh, clients trading uh, equities at 70 basis points. 70 basis points, 70. 70 basis points uh, means on a $10 million ticket, 70,000 US dollars. That business in the last 15 years has moved very, very rapidly to one basis point. And one basis point, so $10 million, it's tiny, tiny, tiny. You cannot pay for people anymore to be in the middle of that. And if technology can do it better, you have to embrace it. But then if you have other people that have technology which is cheaper and faster and has a unit cost which is lower, they will be able to go closer and closer to that basis point so that they can be profitable and serve a, a higher volume. Uh, the third is the global banks. So the global banks, uh, so while the broker dealers are at the forefront of the product innovation, the global banks play a key role in the distribution of financial products through the retail arms. Managing wealth through their private banking business and protecting and segregating assets through their custodian business. The breadth of these services will lead to enhanced raise to achieve scale and efficiencies driving further specialization by client type and asset class. If you look at this slide, what I really wanted to represent is uh, it's a very, very uh, dramatic change. It has not happened yet uh, in the, the whole of the banking industry. But if you think about the three generations in front of a traditional bank, uh, you have my father on the left. Uh, he, he deals and interacts with the branch manager. He always has. The branch manager probably welcomes him with an iPad. My father has an iPad as well in his briefcase. He doesn't know how to use it very well, but when he goes home, he gets an email, he clicks on it, and he can kind of see his positions, you know, what he's traded, how, what's the balance on his account. Then it's, uh, I wouldn't say it's me, because me, I'm, I'm probably younger, no? And I'm uh, probably more on this side. And I've adopted technology, but there's someone here in his uh, 40s, 50s, has started his interaction with banks on the left, has now moved on, on uh, in the middle and is a little confused. There are things he does on this side, things he does on that side. So when he goes and plans for, for the, 
don't know, it wants to open a mortgage, probably doesn't do it online. It walks into a branch and says, I'm about to buy a 500,000 pounds house, and you interact with the branch manager. When you do your uh, uh, motor insurance, you go online. You know, how many people have walked into a branch of a broker or a bank to do a motor insurance, a house insurance? And then you have uh, the generation X and Y. Uh, they will never walk into a branch. They will never walk into a branch. I lived here for 15 years, uh, despite my accent. I walked into a branch. The first day I came to London, I opened my account. I haven't been since. Uh, these guys will never go. And in uh, certain, uh, many emerging economies where banking was skipped and where wealth is being created today, they will go to work and they will be paid digitally and they will dispose of their assets digitally and they will want to have those services. Then this is uh, the representation for the electronic market makers. Uh, there's been a lot of noise around electronic market makers, a lot of regulations, a lot of uh, uh, people being upset about uh, their uh, uh, how do you say, the dominance over the last few years. If you look at uh, what was happening before, and I use as an example New York Stock Exchange, there was a monopoly of market making that was owned by the specialist on the floor. No specialist ever, ever lost money. And they were not very bright. If you met them, I met them uh, many years ago. They had no education, they just had the monopoly position of sitting on a stock. They made a lot of money. So that industry before was dominated by people with the dominant position that had the floor space, was the banks, and they had the space, and they had the monopoly of uh, making markets in a certain stock. They had the flow, they had the information. All of that is now uh, available online and, and is available to anyone. And the electronic market makers took an industry that employed 10, 20, 30,000 people making markets, not very efficiently, not very transparently, with spreads that were not very good, uh, sometimes taking advantage of their clients, many times. Um, this is never really said, but when you meet people that were in the industry 20, 30 years ago, the stories they tell you are quite uh, telling. And then there's new players that came in and they competed in a very uh, regulated environment. There was an exchange that allowed them to uh, put the service at the exchange. They were all as close as each other. Of course, they will never be, um, they will always be closer than a fund manager. They will always be closer than a private client. But the reality, that's the same before. You know, if a manager was trading with a bank that happened to be sitting at the pit of the local stock exchange, and that gap always existed. And now that gap is microseconds, but somehow the industry took you know, many, many, many thousand people, had a few hundred people uh, dominating the space, and the spreads became very, very, very tiny. And this brought uh, a huge um, uh, innovation to the industry somehow, and, and huge benefits. And uh, I believe that the benefits are only positive. I mean, th if there's anyone that does anything which is illegal, it should be uh, pursued. Uh, but that's the same in, in any other business. Uh, I do believe that uh, this uh, part of the industry is here to stay. Uh, and they are now starting to look at other asset classes. They started in futures. They moved on to do equities. Uh, they're moving into FX. And very likely, at some point, when OTC products will go electronic, transparent, they will be the dominant players making markets in those uh, asset classes. This is uh, now the, how I wanted to represent technology. You know, uh, so what happens is now that if you look at, uh, if you think about what I said in the last uh, 10, 15 minutes, everything is about technology. Um, and every single player that was represented before is uh, surrounded by technology and uh, challenges within technology. So there are going to be specialists that become part of the jigsaw and the value chain. And what I wanted to represent here is really uh, a manufacturing plant. And go back to the analogies I was making with the tires. You have uh, someone producing cars. Many, many, many specialized firms produce components. So 50, 60, 70 years ago, a car manufacturer would do probably 60, 70% of the components were produced in-house. Now probably 5% are produced in-house. Everything else is about assembling, assembling batteries, wipers, engine, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Some of the new players, and maybe the analogy is not uh, as strong as uh, uh, what I may think, but it's some of the new players will become actors on, on their own right and will become companies that provide similar services. So if you think about cars, 
maybe Tesla is the right analogy. You know, they, they, they moved from petrol uh, fueled engine to electronic fueled engine and said, you know what, no one can collaborate, we'll do it ourselves. Of course, they will go and buy tires, they will go and buy batteries, but now they own that and they become a dominant player themselves, competing with BMW, but potentially they will also uh, develop technology uh, for batteries, they will go on BMW. So it, these are the, exactly the same dynamics that uh, we are seeing in this industry, which are all dominated by volume, scale, technology, um, and unit cost. Uh, so, in summary, the creative destruction uh, of the old by creating of the new holds truth today in the banking industry. We're entering an era of high specialization, uh, and it's, in my opinion, driven by the consolidation of businesses specifically for trading around these uh, uh, five pillars. Uh, overcapacity will be removed by the industry, many players will exit. Um, and uh, any effort uh, to protect the status quo uh, at any cost will lead only to destruction of value. Um, when the dust settles, uh, there will be some players of the past that have not only survived but thrived in this environment, UBS and Nomura maybe, uh, LSE, uh, Deutsche Börse. There will be some dominant players from today that will be completely wiped out, and we've seen it in manufacturing, we've seen it in uh, in, in the same, in different industries in the past. And there will be some key uh, innovator that will become a key player and will potentially uh, be part of the value chain, either collaborating, pro providing components or providing the, the whole lot or one part of the services. Um, that's uh, my presentation. Thank you very much. And uh, we don't have time for questions, but I'll be here for the, the entire afternoon. We'll have break and uh, I can speak to you at the end of the day. You want to ask a question? No, no, wait, wait, wait. Okay. Thank you. Thanks to Matteo for that, and we're going to move on now to our first panel discussion of the afternoon. Uh, what does the future hold for trading volumes and market structures? I'll introduce the panelists and uh, the moderator. Our moderator uh, first is Philip Stafford. He's the editor of FT Trading Room. And our panelists, uh, if you'd like to take your seat. Uh, Dr. Robert Barnes, CEO of Turquoise. Is he here? Yes, he is indeed. Welcome, Dr. Robert Barnes. Andrew Bowley, Head of Market Structure Strategy at Nomura. James Davis, partner at Oliver Wyman. And Sarah Hay, Executive Director of Liquidity Strategy and Market Structure at UBS. A very warm welcome to our panelists. So there will be some time for your questions at the end of each uh, panel discussion, but uh, to moderate this afternoon we have Philip Stafford who will lead the discussion. Uh, it's very, very good to have such a high calibre of panellists this afternoon for all our debates, and I hope you appreciate the, the views. Uh, the debate is scheduled to last about 30 minutes in this case. We'll try and finish up, Philip, just a little bit earlier, 25 minutes, 20 minutes, yeah. so, so we have plenty of time for questions from the floor. And also, I've already got some questions via hashtag trading debates, which I also would like to put to the panelists as well. Philip, if you think there's a suitable time for me to bring in a question from Twitter, then please feel free. I know. But uh, over to you, Philip. OK. Um, welcome, everybody. Um, I think we wanted to... Uh, to extend uh, some of uh, Matteo's excellent opening comments uh, about uh, the state of the market and what might be changing. And uh, that's really what the, the panel is about today. Um, first of all, I should really uh, very briefly introduce everybody, uh, just in case you um, don't know, but uh, actually you've already done that, so I won't bother. Um, so, first of all, I wanted to start off, maybe I'll start with you, Andrew, seeing you at the end there, don't feel left out. Trading volumes are down, Not, never mind on 2008 levels when, uh, let's hope we don't see that again, but even down on a couple of years ago. Are we seeing something structural changing in the market, or is this cyclical? And if it's structural, what do you think is changing? Yeah, Philip, um, 
Yeah, without a doubt, there was a, a marked decrease since 2007, 2008. Uh, the businesses have felt that throughout. And uh, you know, linked in with some of the comments that Matteo is making, that, that of course, with lower volumes in, in, in businesses that are volume driven, makes it a lot harder to, to operate at all. Um, the, the kind of drivers behind volume ultimately are going to come from two, two sides of an equation. One is the the kind of economic drivers, if you like, and I guess there are speakers here today, later on after us, who will talk a bit more about the, the underlying economics. Um, but the other side of it is, is very much the market structure and the way the market is, is, is organised. Um, you know, as Matteo said as well, it, it's become an interesting theme. You know, there's, there's a whole industry now of people sat along this panel who are focused around handling and dealing with an ever-evolving market structure. Uh, and in particular, after the, the, the credit crisis and the events of, of, of 07, 08, there is a massive regulatory pressure on the industry to change uh, behaviours and, and the, the, the kind of risk regimes, the control regimes, the market structure regimes, transparency uh, are all being pushed forward, uh, quite possibly uh, to the detriment of, of uh, the ability for some people to trade and operate, and, and that is certainly harming volumes. So people are specialising in the roles they're playing, some people are exiting the markets, and certainly banks are not feeling as convinced as they did in the past that they need to be in every part of the value chain. So the specialisation is coming through, people are exiting the market. To, uh, to pick up on that point, James, this is about more than just behaviours, isn't it? This is uh, about really changing the way that, uh, that a lot of the market is, is actually traded, possibly quite differently from how it had happened in the last 15, 20 years. I think that's right. I, mean, I think there's certainly a, a cyclical element to, to volumes over the last couple of years, and that, that shouldn't be underestimated. I think you just look at what happened in September in, in some of the markets. Uh, when you saw volatility come back, you know, volumes did come back as well. So I think there's, there's a cyclical element that we shouldn't forget about, but the, the secular piece is, is, is large um, and important. And I think there's, a lot of the trends are, are there and, and, and are likely to stay. I mean, there's, there's pressures on capital and balance sheet, which hit some of the more historically OTC intermediated markets and will be pushing those into new uh, ways of trading. And then there's the changes which are hitting the already more liquid markets, um, particularly with pressure on some of the end clients and the way that, that, that they trade. I think it was interesting to see in, in equity markets over the last few years, you've seen this big you know, uh, rally in, in index levels, but you haven't seen the same pickup in volumes uh, and revenues ultimately for the sell side. Uh, and that's partly due to changing behaviours uh, amongst the sell side's clients. Sarah, I mean, the, uh, speaking as a sell side here, um, is, do you think this actually this, this is a, actually a permanent shift that the the revenue shift that James talked about isn't coming back? And if so, where is it going? I think it's going to be interesting to see whether it is permanent or not. Take a step back potentially and look to um, you know, some of the market structural change that we saw in the past back in 2007 with MIFID. Um, so, for example, MIFID. Um, Market. We saw, you know, a, a bit larger fragmentation and proliferation of new venues coming up there. And I think what we started to see more recently was more consolidation in that space. So, um, you know, sorry, I think it's on. Is that better? Um, so I think what we saw them moving forward was some um, consolidation in, in this space. So we saw some players exit the market and we saw some consolidation um, with players such as Batch, Chiax, for example. So I think we started to see some consolidation in the venue space, which has largely been driven um, by structural changes. Um, I think it would be interesting going forward what we'll see under MIFID 2 and that regulation moving forward in terms of how that will affect volumes um, in the space, in, in the equities market as well. Um, we may come on to that later, but we can potentially talk about some of the potential uh, impact on liquidity of future regulation as well. Robert, uh, how much of this is, is actually being driven by regulation and how much of it is just the sheer um, economics of, uh, of the world that's changing now? Well, thank you very much. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. The question about is it being driven by regulation or economics, perhaps we should take a look back in recent history because the framework that established MIFID that Sarah has so articulated was based on the Wise Men report that came out in 2001, Alexander von Lamp-Lucy. 
And there were a number of observations and some key conclusions, but it's fascinating to note it, that the futurists are telling us of all the people that have ever lived in the history of the world to the age of 65, half are still alive today. And in the Lanfalusi report, in the Wise Men report, the observation of demographics, people getting older, 65, the age of pensions, the observation is that pension returns need to be higher in order to meet the future liability. Number two, in Europe, when one was looking over a period of time of growth, European assets were underperforming US assets. Therefore, there was a need to introduce competitive entry and other frameworks in Europe to make the European market investment returns more competitive. So those of us, the humble market operators, the thought leaders on this panel that are focused on trying to implement more efficient investment returns, let us just share with you an example or two of why this matters. In the Lanfalusi report, they had a beautiful table. I'll just give you one example. For the average career of 40 years, if one wants a pension equivalent to 35% of the final salary, and real returns are 2%, every year, that person must pay away 20% of the salary for 40 years. And ladies and gentlemen, today investment returns are challenged in an interest rate environment of zero in Europe. That means our opportunity together to work in partnership to promote liquidity and new business, ideally to minimize the slippage costs, the impact of investment. When that compounds over many years, that can be positive for all of us in the industry. Mm -hmm. Andrew, I mean, this really what, what's happening here that ultimately the, the big picture is economic and, and demographic related. And what we're seeing is a real squeeze of efficiency everywhere within the, the plumbing in order to, to ultimately benefit uh, ordinary investors. No, it's absolutely the case. Um, you know, as, as, as Robert said, there's, there's a number of drivers. It's, it's interesting to think that in 2007, when MIFID I came in as a set of regulation, that was really the crux of a lot of innovation coming into our industry. Uh, Chiax, which was the, started from zero in March 2007, is now the biggest stock exchange in Europe. Uh, it launched ahead of the regulation. And there's a very good argument to say it would have succeeded and developed and we would see that kind of landscape irrespective of the regulation going through. The reason being is it is driving cost and it is driving efficiency. It's very interesting that one of the, uh, one of the big themes in, in uh, the, the, the financial services industry right now is, is kind of best execution. The UK FCA have written up a, a, a fairly critical report across the whole industry on, on that theme. And uh, you know, some of the, the elements within that are about the pricing structures that are represented out to clients. There's even a suggestion that, that the end customer should pay the exchange fees, should actually pay the actual trading fees that are incurred in the execution um, in order to ensure that there is a, in, a transparency and efficiency. Um, and, and when we look at those kind of equations and questions, so we've, we've looked at the margins, we've looked at the costs, and, and without a doubt, there has been a, a long-term decline in cost, but there's also been a, a compounded long-term decline in, in margin that the, the brokers and the intermediaries have, have earned on that business, and uh, both together have provided a great benefit to the end customer. But we're really talking in increments now. I'm, I'm Sarah, I mean, uh, we've gone as far, you know, we're, we're really talking about small squeeze. I mean, I mean Matteo made that, that uh, very illuminating point about how uh, you know people are just sat on on huge margins in the past. That's gone. Um, I'm sure that's never coming back. Um, is this this is really just tinkering around the edges, isn't it? I think. I mean, you're right. I think we are coming into a low, lower margin environment. But I think that's you've got to take a step back and remember. Um, you know, that's where innovation plays out. That's where scale plays out. We talked about scale and specialisation, investing in technology. I think players that have invested in there have got the opportunity to potentially still survive in, in environments such as this. I think the key point to make is you need to invest in technology, but you also need to invest in people. Um, the, you know, human touch, it really adds to the real value add that we can give in this industry. And we talk about low margins, we talk about automation. I think um, we still have people in that process that really add value to that. 
James, how, how do you invest in technology though without it becoming a millstone around the neck? Because it's very easy to get caught in this spiral, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, I think it's often hard to make a case when you're investing in, in trading technology around gaining revenues and adding uh, new upside. Um, it's often about taking out cost and finding new ways of doing things more efficiently, or particularly in balance sheet intensive businesses, finding ways of uh, recycling that balance sheet more rapidly. So the way that it thinks about it, you can't think about it in isolation from the rest of the business. It needs to be a way of changing the way you do your business. Um, I certainly take the point from Sarah as well that it, you know, there are other ways in which people get paid in, in this industry and people are paid for content and for connection to corporates and to connection to other um, uh, people in the market. And so I think you are seeing in, in some of these, in one of the, the other aspects of MIFID and, and current regulation, which is challenging, is trying to unpick those different ways of being paid for offering different types of services. And you're seeing a world in which you've got a very fiercely competed margin and technology-driven execution environment and potentially a, a more separated piece of business around, around content. Mm -hmm and some of those value-added services. Robert, you probably have many, many uh, presentations pitched at you every week uh, in terms of if we just spend more on technology and we just spend here, then the world will be ours. What do you look for? Uh, what are the no-nos that uh, when you're um, considering going into, into new markets and new products? Well, thank you very much. Well, clearly, there are some key prerequisites to a successful business case. One is client demand. Number two is a structural efficiency to deliver that demand. And number three, it has to work within the regulatory framework. Because regulators provide the framework within which we can behave as entrepreneurs. And the success of the entrepreneurial spirit manifests as innovation. And I'll just give you one example. We've talked a little bit about costs. Many of us around the table and in the audience have worked for many years to try to make the market's more efficient. Trading, clearing, settlement, widening the geographic diversification we can access. And tariffs have come so low that what we really see the opportunity now is to save the implicit costs. And I'll just give you a real world example. On the way over to this room today, I was called by a broker out in the Nordics saying they're very pleased at being able to get a trade in turquoise on cross, a midpoint book, where they were saving more than seven basis points now, this compares to a public tariff of 0.3. The opportunity for us is to allow investors to access the investments they need without slippage costs. Thank you. Just the one plug then. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> Sarah, I mean, normally you would think that in, in, in the good times when the money's rolling in, that's the time when you would actually want to innovate. Um, is it, does it actually work the other way, that when the money's tough, that's when you've really got to think about things? You know, when, and when things are so, so cheap that actually that's where you really see the, um, the change come about. I think that's a good point. Um, I would say that I think it's continuous in terms of innovation that's required in the market. In our world, we're continually having to innovate. And as we talk about um, technology and um, the need to invest in that and the fact that there are lower margins, I think that's where we need to innovate in terms of how we do that, how we deliver that service to our clients. Um, so I think it is continuous. And as Robert made a, a very good point in terms of regulators setting the framework within which we can innovate and uh, within which you know, change can come about, we saw catalyst for change, as we've noted in, in, in MIFID. And really, I think there'll probably further catalyst being seen when we see MIFID 2 as well. Uh, yeah, go on. Yeah. yeah, I was going to say, one of the more interesting things in the industry right now is, is the uh, kind of carry across from the equities world into other asset classes. And uh, if, if, when you look at the, the fixed income market in particular, there is a point of maturity with a uh, record high holding of fixed income assets by, by the investment community and a record low pools of inventory within the sell side brokerages, the providers of liquidity. And uh, people are looking at the, the combination of regulation, that structural challenge and technology and trying to find the ways to bring those together. Ultimately, for the end customer, it's the liquidity that, that they need access to. And we need to find ways to, to better distribute that set of assets beyond just the equities asset class. If you're, if, if you're sat in, in the middle of this, I mean, don't, doesn't this effectively mean you have to run harder to stand still? The volumes, arguably, aren't a lot different than they were a decade ago. You take out the six, seven, eight, nine. Uh, exceptionalism. 
and you know you, you've still got similar uh, amounts of volumes, but the profit isn't there, is it? It's a harder, it's a harder world, isn't it? it, it it's a much harder world, which is probably a good thing because it makes, you know, it makes it a lot more competitive, a lot more efficient. Uh, certainly, there's a scale gain. So if you're investing in technology, um, you you want scale to come with that. But but certainly, as long alongside the scale is is the specialisation. So people need to think about where they want to play in that market. Am I a, an intermediary? Am I providing a customer-facing service and access to liquidity pools? Or am I a liquidity pool in its own right? Or am I a market maker? And uh, I think houses are becoming a lot more specialised and focused in the way they think about things, whereas banks in the past probably tried to be everything to everyone. Mm -hmm. Just on, on that point, I, I am conscious of, of time. Were there any questions? Questions okay. from the floor. Okay. Uh, I have one. Floor? Yes, I have one from Twitter though, yeah, and it was just uh, the point being made about liquidity. It follows on quite neatly from that point you were discussing just now, and it's from Duncan Dobbin. Uh, to what extent do you believe regulation of proprietary trading has removed liquidity from global markets? If we can have a brief, sort of thirty-second answer from each panelist, that would be great. I think from, from my side, last week was a testament to that. There was uh, some, some kind of structural news and, and, and activity in the market and liquidity was, was very hard to come by and, and certainly anecdotally it seems that the combination of uh, the Volcker rule and uh, the various kind of capital directives have tightened liquidity. So we do need to find different ways to, to structure that liquidity distribution. And again, technology I think is central to that. Yeah, I, th I think I'd, I'd agree with that. It's both proprietary trading restrictions themselves and the capital and balance sheet restrictions that are particularly in OTC-driven markets, pushing banks just to, to be much more selective and much more uh, sort of meagre in what they sort of commit to the market. I think I'd probably echo all those comments. <laughs> <laughs> yes? yes. Yeah. Uh, Philip, would you like to take some questions yeah, any, from the any floor? Any questions from the floor? Yeah, yes. Just uh, for, the, for those of you who couldn't hear it, there was a question about uh, um, the impact of disruptors like crowdfunders and peer-to-peer -peer lending and, and the impact of that. Um, let's start from this end. Mr. Thank you very Robert. much. Yes, that's an excellent question. When investors are looking to access the market, choice allows multiple channels. So the traditional channel of the large institutions accessing the human sales trader can add value. The electronic channel to access the smart order router for all the multiple pools and puddles can add value. At a time when investors in Europe are looking to trade larger size, innovations like we're implementing at Turquoise, thank you to our customers, is adding value. Of course, peer-to-peer -peer and crowdfunding, this is a whole new opportunity to embrace if there's a level playing field and an orderly market, yes, why not have it? Thank you. I think I'll probably echo a lot of Robert's views. I think if it's representing the same... I think, you know, the market is about competition, so, um, yeah. James, what's the what effect of peer-to-peer -peer lending crowdfunding going to have, do you think? Yeah, no, I could extend that to look at other, you know, sort of non-bank participation and parts of market making and, you know, direct crossing networks and those kind of things. I think all of those things are things that, that to a degree, obviously they're threats to, to the traditional incumbents in the markets, but they're also, you know, opportunities. And there were some banks who were looking at parts of the business and saying, you know, I'm not advantaged in this part of the market. I've been trying to do everything and I, it doesn't work well for me under today's economics and maybe I can leverage <laughs> Uh, some of these disruptors, um, either renting their technology or tying up in a joint venture in some way where you provide access to their liquidity. There's, there's very different ways in which um, you know, the, these, diff these different uh, providers can combine. And I think you know, the, in the current climate where everyone's under a lot of pressure um, to squeeze out returns, there's much more openness to thinking about those kind of options. Andrew? Yeah, our market structure today is defined by, by innovators uh, across the spectrum. Uh, from the exchanges, Chayek's mentioned earlier, I've got the founder here today. Uh, we have um, 
uh, changes innovation in, in the liquidity provision, and that's the high frequency firms that we've, we've talked about. Uh, banks are trying to specialise, and again, this is where the specialisation is coming through, trying to find a niche. Uh, we're finding in other asset classes, um, you know, fixed income, the, the, the kind of the, the, the hot name is, is a company called Algamy, which is a, a fintech startup. Um, and we're also, I think, seeing more discussion about commonality of infrastructure and perhaps open source infrastructure, shared costs coming into the industry, again, to tackle that broader challenge of cost efficiency and, uh, and, and the spend that people are, are applying to, to stay in the business. Maybe okay. if I can just build on the, on the car tyre analogy from earlier. I think everyone was making cars previously and they're now working out that they actually need a network of people to make tyres for them and for them to choose what kind of cars they choose to make and what they actually choose to assemble versus make themselves versus, versus just specialise on the design and distribution piece. So people are thinking much more selectively about how they, how they play in that market. Okay, uh, question here. Uh, again, if, uh, if you didn't quite hear it, the um, question about whether um, we're either over-regulated or it's being uh, directed in the wrong place. Um, anyone? Uh, yes, you're allowed to say yes to over-regulation. <laughs> so, love to take that one. So, yeah. so, so Europe actually, I think, has got a structural problem around regulation, which is that we have a, a very slow-moving fundamental framework. So we talk about MIFID as being the, 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 the regulatory structure that drives the trading environment. We had MIFID 1 in 2007, MIFID 2 will come in 10 years later, 2017. Any mistakes of that will probably be sorted out in 2027. It is a slow process. Against that, there is a huge amount of regulation, and, and that's challenging. Um, but also we're finding that within the regulation, the, the real kind of understanding and the nuances are hard to get across to the, the community that is driving it, which is ultimately the, the, the politicians sat in Brussels who are being fed by their constituents. Uh, and one of the biggest challenges, particularly when we go into the OTC markets, is the combination of transparency and liquidity. And the two are at odds with each other, but the focus in the political circles is on transparency. Yeah, go on, James. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, one other issue I think that we've sort of highlighted a few times in the past is around just the regional fragmentation of that as well. This, the sheer complexity of trying to operate across multiple markets now is, is, is incredible, um, both from a capital and funding and liquidity point of view, but also from a compliance with all the different regulations about how you're allowed to trade what asset classes under what conditions. And that naturally, and then you combine that with you know, more emphasis on post-trade clearing and those naturally fragmenting around regional um, sort of centres, you just operate in an environment where it's much harder to play a role of a global, um, you know, connector of liquidity and intermediary, um, and that becomes a much more expensive proposition, and that obviously has, has costs. Sarah? Yes. Just to um, go back on the transparency question that, that obviously Andrew's raised and, and the slowness around European politics. So, um, in terms of transparency, you know, we as an industry, we're very supportive of transparency. We think it's good, but it, that's weighing it up relative to the effects on liquidity. If you look at some of the examples coming out of MIFID 2, we do potentially see some impacts, um, some regulation coming through that could have some impact on liquidity. So if we look at volume caps on non-displayed liquidity, for example, you know, the, the prediction for that is it could impact uh, liquidity that not necessarily will go back to the lip markets. It, it could change the way that we trade in, in the markets and used to already starting to see innovation and, and solutions coming in. Yeah, obviously, um, Robert's mentioned the turquoise solution for that, but I think that really is um, going to change potentially the way we trade in that respect. You see risk deferrals, so shortening timeframes for risk deferrals could have a, um, you know, an effect in terms of leading to a higher cost for trading on risk and therefore potential um, decrease in liquidity. And then again, we haven't talked about European FTT, and I know many of the details are still out there, but what we do know is that there will be something in place by January 2016, and I do think that will have some threat to, to, to potentially liquidity in Europe. And we have to remember that we're looking at Europe now on a kind of relative to the global um, market as a whole, and just moving back mm -hmm. into the discussions of where value is going and, and how Europe is positioned relative to other markets in the globe. 
but you're being a little bit optimistic with the FTT. But um, <laughs> final question, uh, final comments to uh, Robert, maybe without reference to any recent turquoise uh, um, <laughs> products. Thank you very much. When we look at regulation, yes, we will comply with regulation. But what about the insights and the implications? In MIFID, the aim was an attempt to harmonize a definition of best execution. Previously, every country had a definition. Most of them emphasized best price. But today, best execution is a process to deliver the best result on a continuous basis. Now, that may sound woolly, but there are two obligations we should be aware of. Number one, investment firms, sell side and buy side, have the obligation on request to provide information about the best execution policy. Number two, those firms on request must provide evidence of complying with that best execution policy. So what's the implication? Ladies and gentlemen, the insight is that this framework has effectively empowered us as investors, empowered us by our ability to evaluate, monitor, justify, and decide which broker, which venue to get the best execution. And that comes back to the comments of our distinguished panelists. That will drive competition and innovation. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you very much indeed to all our panellists. A very warm round of applause, please. Thank you so much. And there seems to be a nice flow emerging here. We were talking about liquidity and uh, fintech, and that is our, the focus of our next trading debate this afternoon. May I ask the panellists for the second debate, please, to take their seats.